folks, today I'm charged up. But not just any charge. Oh, no. I'm mega charged up to talk about the next generation of electric vehicles with Dr. Martin Schultz from Little Fuse. But what vehicles in particular are we talking about? The newest and greatest personal electric cars? Oh, no. We're talking about fleets of commercial vehicles that include electric long-haul trucks and autonomous commercial vehicles. But how are we going to power this next generation of electric vehicles? With the help of thyristors. That's how. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In order to move forward with a large-scale implementation of commercial electric vehicles, we need to consider efficiency, availability, reliability, and longevity of the megawatt chargers needed for these applications. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Dr. Martin Schultz from Little Fuse joins me to discuss the infrastructure demands of electric commercial vehicles, the role that galvanic isolation plays here, and why thyristors may be a great choice for the future of electric commercial vehicles. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Little Fuse. Hi, Martin. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. And the thrilling topic about megawatts in electric commercial vehicle charging. Yes, I am super excited to talk about electric commercial vehicles today. But Martin, before we dig into the details, we need to talk about the infrastructure to support these vehicles. So Martin, where do we stand in terms of charging infrastructure today? Well, charging is a key feature in the electric mobility and not only for passenger cars, but especially in vehicles for commercial use. So charging infrastructure, particularly for commercial vehicles, can be roughly separated in three chapters. And let's go through all three of them. The very first thing to check is a very traditional way. You got a fleet of vehicles, be it postal delivery or a bus fleet, and typically those vehicles are charged in a depot. So depot charging consists of chargers that are well capable to provide something like 50, 60 kilowatts per vehicle, which means every vehicle has a dedicated charger, as you can see on the picture. Charging takes place overnight. So between shifts and on night operation, there is four to six hours available for charging, idle time, particularly in operating buses or postal delivery vehicles that are idle at night. And this means you get away with lower power levels. But it has an additional advantage because the depot will become a major part of the infrastructure as a whole, may even be covered with solar power cells or with additional batteries. And this allows to balance the charging of the vehicles. So the vehicles that need to be in service the very next day could be charged on higher power, while the vehicles that are scheduled later in the day can have lower power levels. This means you can get away from instantly charging at full peak power and have a more grid-friendly scheduled charging. Additionally, your vehicles may have the ability to get energy back into the grid and support the grid in peak demands, which is also interesting. Interesting particularly because fleets have to be considered differently in the future. One fact to think about is the U.S. has roughly half a million of those yellow buses running. And they run in the morning to pick up pupils and they bring them back in the evening and they're idle in between. And then there's the 100 days of summer vacation where those are idling, which means you have batteries on wheels, a huge potential, more than 120,000 megawatt hour battery capacity. That's more than the biggest pumped hydro will ever get you, both in power and in energy stored. So that might be something where fleet operators may add additional money on. Wow. So finally, new technologies make all this happen? No. <laughs> That's not a brilliantly new idea. We got better technology than 100 years ago, but this is a picture from St. Pancras Station in London. And that's electric vehicle being charged by wire from individual outlets. Well, 
we got lead gel batteries by that time or lead acid batteries and DC chargers were a little more clumsy and less efficient than today, but the idea is far from being new. There have been other things that came to mind. If you take a look at trains, they take power from overhead lines and using pantographs. And the idea is intriguing and can be brought to electric vehicles as well. So pantograph charging has a few very nice advantages. Power levels can grow because the pantograph is a high power device and you can exceed 125 kilowatts of power easily, potentially twice as much. And you need to because you can only charge one vehicle at a time and you only have a few minutes to do so. So to transfer a reasonable amount of energy, you need high power levels. Particularly when there's a shift in driver or the driver has to take a lunch break, there may be certain positions where longer periods take place and larger amounts of energy can be stored. But this is a very nice thing also because it doesn't impact the infrastructure on ground. So you can put it up at literally any bus station. And here too, there's an important side note. You too can use stationary batteries as part of the bus stop and use it to reduce the peak load to the grid. So you can charge the battery permanently on very low power levels, 10, 20 kilowatts only. And once the bus approaches and connects, the battery can use bursts of power for a few minutes to recharge the bus on very high capacity, but the grid doesn't see this peak demand. And that's relieving the grid of a lot of stress. And the batteries can add very similarly to the vehicle's batteries itself, to achieve further grid services, frequency stabilization, peak shaving, emergency backup, all this becomes possible if you have battery storage available. Whether this battery storage is on wheels or stationary, well, for the power electronics section, it doesn't really matter. Recharging the batteries in idle times, particularly at night, may add another intriguing idea. Around the world, there is a phenomena that at night you have more energy than you need, which means there's a good chance that the price for energy will turn negative. You could earn money on charging the batteries, storing the energy you need to drive your fleet. So more business models coming up that cut cost and make urban transport cheaper than today. Huh. I never thought about that, Martin. So is this brand new technology or no? Sorry, it's not. We've been there. We've done that. So this is a picture from Germany. Dates back 50 years. And there have been fleets of buses with pantograph charging in service for more than 15 years already. The one on the picture is currently in the German museum. And the trailer is the battery. Which means, well, this awesome piece of hardware could only do quick charge battery swapping, literally. However, we got better technology. Power electronics becomes more powerful, efficiency grows, and the tender here is six tons of lead acid batteries. Well, today, the lithium-ion batteries fit into the car. You don't need to pull a tender anymore. But the pantograph, well, we're using pantographs on traction applications like locomotives for decades. It's not new. It's just using existing technology to serve another application. I see. So what about wireless power transfer? We've talked about that a bit in previous Chalk Talks. Yeah, wireless power transfer is great to charge your smartphone. And technically, you can charge a car with the same technology. So you got a sending coil in the grounds, you have a receiving coil in your vehicle, and you can transfer energy by magnetic field, by induction. So wireless power transfer looks great on paper. However, the standards define that the switching frequency for the transfer needs to be pretty high, 80 to 140 kilohertz. And currently, the systems in service are limited to less than 25 kilowatts. It also serves one vehicle at a time, but you only want a few minutes to charge. So one of the ideas is, well, we do this for taxis. Taxi is a commercial vehicle too, or for trucks. There was the idea to put an inductive sender on every traffic light and wherever your car stops, you can recharge a little. But given that you take a break for a few minutes only, those 25 kilowatts will get you not too much of a distance. Also, the accuracy about how your vehicle is aligned with the sending coil matters on uh, the efficiency of transfer. So there's a few ups here, but there's a lot of downs there. Particularly, you want 
the sending coil to be on public space. And projects that open up public space for infrastructure are massively expensive because you need a construction site set up, you need to block roads, and may not be the best solution for heavy-duty commercial vehicles. However, the position accuracy that matters may be overcome by autonomous vehicles. And the impact to the infrastructure is something you should take into account. However, more important is you're handling enormous energy densities. So you need to make sure that you're not frying neighbor's cats or have short-circuiting by metal objects. When those first power transfer systems came online, it was a fun by teenagers to dump in tetra packs into the transmission. And because of the aluminum inside, they instantly heat up and explode. And you don't want your system to damage things. So keep detection for foreign objects and live objects is needed, is technically feasible, however, it demands further effort. And then there's an upturn. If you have an application where you have fixed routes with dedicated starts and stops, then inductive charging may really make sense. That's, for example, for the baggage trolley that move your baggage on the airports. Airports are typically flat, so you don't need a lot of energy to go uphill. And the trolleys start and stop at the same position all day. And they only need energy to travel for a few hundred meters or a few kilometers per shift or per transfer. So the energies involved are pretty low. And then you're not on public space. It's semi-public, but it's not in city. And then for material handling, baggage handling, it may be a very valid option too. That said, here is how charging infrastructure needs to be considered for the next generation. And to get a background on what this means, here is a few numbers on trucks. If you want your heavy-duty long-haul logistics as you're used to from diesel, you start to think about battery capacity of a megawatt hour to do 500 kilometers or more per charge. The magic number is 350 because you can go 80 kilometers an hour at maximum average speed, and you can go four hours before your driver by law has to make a break. So getting 500 kilometers per charge is nice if you can recharge during the driver's lunch break. So if you want 80% of the battery, that's the typical consideration, 10 to 90 charge, 80%, or 800 kilowatt in the driver's lunch break, 30 minutes, you need 1.6 megawatts of chargers. That is a factor of four to five higher than you do for passenger cars. But that's not the end of the line. The end of the line is that we're seeing the autonomous trucks coming up. And an autonomous truck, well, for physical reasons, demands to have the same energy on board to drive the same distance, but it doesn't feature a driver. So there's no recreational break. And time is money. Idle time is something that logistic operators want to prevent. So you want the downtime for charging to remain low. Consequence, if you need to charge in half the time, well, you need twice the power. And suddenly, we start talking about three megawatts of charging. And that is, industrial-wise, not the big deal. We handle megawatts all the time. But for batteries and chargers, three megawatts is quite a big thing to handle. So, Martin, what kind of output voltage and current are we talking about for these kind of vehicles? That's a big step from passenger cars. So, charging commercial vehicle, as you said, is an application where you need to control the output voltage and output current. But let's start with cars, just to get you the scale. Cars today have a cutoff voltage, the best ones, 920 volt, and the maximum current allowed is 500 amps. However, you won't get 500 amps on 900 volts, which means you got this by-the-way area, which is the limiting power. So high power charging for passenger cars is 920 volts, 500 amps maximum ratings. However, there's a 350 kilowatt maximum rating as well. That's why you don't get the full square. And now let's blow this up to the commercial vehicle scale. We need 1500 volt cutoff and we need 3000 amp charging current. Whoa. So that adds up to currently slightly more than two megawatts. You also got this by the way area, which is the limitation of this charging standard. The maximum cutoff is 1500 volt. 
And this will not be exceeded for safety reasons. The 3000 amp today are a reasonable limit and the power level achieved today is 2.2 megawatt. However, there's a backdoor and this backdoor is the standard is open to extend this to the full current at the full voltage, which gets it upgraded to 4.5 megawatt indeed. Okay, so when it comes to the higher kilowatt chargers, Martin, what kind of methodologies are currently in use? Difficult to tell. So here's a classical approach to build the 350 kilowatt passenger car thing. You take the low voltage grid, while in energy provision, low voltage is anything below 1,000 volts. It's three-phase AC, and you got input rectifiers and power factor controllers in place. The output of these is a DC voltage. This DC voltage is transferred to high-frequency AC, given to a galvanic isolation stage, which demands rectification. And then you get a DC that is compatible to the battery. You put all of this in one rack. And then, hopefully, you have renewable energies in place to support the multitude of those racks, which means each rack has a certain power level. Today, that's anything between 50 and 100 kilowatts. And the sum of racks provides the power to the battery. And this approach is good because you can build lower volumes, lower power sections, and then stack those to, gray, to grow in power. The stacking also allows potentially to achieve redundancy, which means if a single unit fails, you're not losing your charger, you just lose the maximum power. So in commercial vehicle charging, it's very important to take a look at availability. If it fails for a passenger car, well, that's bad for the driver. But if it fails for commercial vehicle, then you suddenly interrupt an industrial process. And that's a totally different magnitude of money lost. However, stacking units also comes with an effort to interconnect all those units, both electrically and with a cooling system. So this is the drawback. And in this approach, every unit has one isolation unit. However, this may not be the best approach. So of course, you can stack a few units to achieve the 350 kilowatt for the passenger car. But if you now stack 350 kilowatt chargers to achieve 2 megawatts, well, you're stacking stacked units. The number of units grows massively, and purely statistically, the reliability drops. And this is bad for availability. So this needs to be rethought. That makes sense. Now, Martin, can you talk a bit more about the galvanic isolation you mentioned? Yes, my pleasure. So let's take a look at the schematic. There's the three-phase power supply, and we said there's a rectifier in it that also contains a power factor correction stage. This is what is seen on screen right now. And then you got a DC link voltage, and you transfer this into a high-frequency AC. And the galvanic isolation typically is a transformer. And this transformer provides the limit of the isolation between the grid and the battery. So very typically, it's a so-called LLC, a resonant technology to make it more efficient. And the output of a classical stage like this is anything between 250 and 750 volt. And this is state of the art, you could say. So three-phase input and the topology seen on the input side is a so-called Vienna rectifier. There's other topologies or other schematics to be used. However, that is the one that turns out to be very efficient and very simple to control. The LLC stage in the drawing, it is parallel connected. You could also series connect it to change the voltage level. And those units are built in a scheme 60 kilowatts, roughly, potentially 75, some rare ones, maybe even 100 kilowatt. Depends on the component in use and the individual manufacturer. And efficiency is on top of the list because you burn a lot of energy if you transfer a lot of energy. So here you can reach the 97 to 98% efficiency using silicon carbide, which is nice, but may not be the top of the line. And the challenging thing here due to regulations and hardware and frequency issues is that it becomes difficult to support the full range. Keep in mind the picture with the charging for passenger cars it demands 200 volts minimum, but 920 volt maximum. So might be challenging. So 
Are there any other means to achieve this kind of isolation? What might be different in a megawatt charger? Well, here's the interesting thing. Read the standards word by word and interpret it properly. Standards prefer solution with galvanic isolation. That's a nice wording because it doesn't say the isolation is mandatory. It's just sort of a nice to have. And the standards prefer this isolation solution. However, they don't tell you where the insulation takes place. So looking at the whole thing of megawatt applications in a slightly different manner, not take the low voltage below 1,000 volts, Take the medium voltage. Anything that exceeds a thousand volt and goes up to 20 kilovolt is considered medium voltage. Typical voltage ranges are 10 and 20 kilovolts. And then, of course, you need a transformer, a high power transformer. You want to handle megawatt. And this transformer could be something with a multitude of AC systems supplying an even high number of AC to DC conversion stages which could be entitled to provide the 700 to 1500 volts and 750 amp each. So by paralleling or connecting them, you can get the high power chargers. The transformer's efficiency is outstanding. There is literally nothing as good in efficiency as high power transformers. Easily it achieve 99% or exceed them. And they need to feature isolation because they are transformers. So you got an isolation here between the grid and the battery. So by the wording of the standards, you offer a solution that has galvanic isolation because this transformer is only supplying power to the one application. It's not providing power to, for example, the bus stop next door or to a recreational area on the highway. It's simply providing power to a single application. And this application becomes a medium voltage application. It reduces the material consumed because now you don't need those individual transformers inside your converters. They all shifted to an entity that you would need anyway because you cannot try taking megawatts from the low voltage. And in, because you get rid of a clumsy magnetic component, your individual modules become smaller. Smaller with the same output power level means you have increased power density. So this all is beneficial. And finally, depending on the control scheme you apply, you could still build this in a redundant way. So if one unit fails, well, the others still remain operational. So Martin, is this finally inventing something breathtakingly new? Um, no. Power electronic is a topic that we follow for decades already. And there's similarities between charging batteries and other applications, particularly electrolysis. So electrolysis to gain aluminum or to create hydrogen is an application that's been out there for decades. We got electrolysis systems supplied in the early 90s, which are still operational. So what this looks like is the so-called B12C topology. B12C is the abbreviation for a bridge that has 12 pulses to the output, which means the DC output is very smooth. The specialty you need is this transformer which here is denoted with the blue and black secondary sides. And the difference between those arrangements is the winding scheme. One is Y-connected and one is delta-connected, which leads to a phase shift. The tie resistors allow to rectify the two systems and make it a single, very smooth, low-ripple DC supply. And this is given to a series of electrolysis cells. An electrolysis cell creates hydrogen and oxygen from water and typically has something like 1.5 to 2 volts. Well, batteries are a sequence of cells with 3 volts to 4 volts. Hmm. So batteries, as well as electrolysis, is an application where you need to apply a precisely controlled DC voltage with a precisely controlled DC current. Literally, it's the same. And then the question is, well, you only have a single stage of energy conversion. You don't do AC to DC, DC to high frequency, high frequency to transformer and rectify the transformer's output, which means you get very low on losses. And if you build this on a typical disk type tie resistor, the good old tie resistor, then you can 
benefit from having the non-linearities of this device. So this tie restor at a throughput of 1,000 amps makes bridges, six packs, with just 2,000 watts of losses. So the efficiency exceeds 99%. If you have 2.2 megawatts of output, you are on less than 5 kilowatts of losses. That's amazing. So thyristors, really? Are you serious? Not a fancy wide band gap silicon carbide or gallium nitride solution? No, it's not. And here is why. So thyristors and efficiency in megawatt applications. How, how good is my estimate that I just showed you? So this thyristor, it's a disk device, a single one. And you need, of course, six pieces to build one bridge. And if you check the data sheet of this tie restor, if you have a 500 amp throughput, then the voltage drop is something like 1,064 millivolts. That's one point. However, if you double the current in a MOSFET, you will have four times the losses. If you double the current in this tie restor, the forward voltage grows to 1,100 millivolt. So the losses don't grow with the square of current. And that's the trick. Let's do a rough estimation. In this bridge six pack, the current goes through your application to one of the top tie resistors and returns through two of the bottom ones to the three phase system, which means one of the tie resistors carries a thousand amps and the other two carry 500 amps. The losses are literally something like 2200 watts per bridge. As you have two bridges involved, you have 4,400 watts of losses, which leads to an efficiency estimate of 99.8. Hmm, pretty good. But how close is such a rough estimate to the real world? Well, we love simulations. So if you calculate it using Plex, then you can see that the current ramps up and you see at 384 watts of losses on the single tie restor. So... Per bridge, the losses are not 2,200, like my estimate, they're 2,300. Which means, if you try the silicon carbide approach with 97% efficiency, which is an achievement, of course, but having a single energy transfer only with tie resistors, efficiency is 99.7.8. We can discuss the digit after the 99, but we get to exceed 99% efficiency. So... Martin, what about a medium voltage type of design? What would we need in this case? Well, the medium voltage application needs this transformer. However, any application that takes this megawatts would be connected to the medium voltage grid and needs a transformer. So even if you build your power conversion stage by silicon carbide MOSFETs, well, you would need a medium voltage transformer. And that means the medium voltage transformer to supply this one application is something that you would need in any setup. And the whole thing, the whole charger this way becomes a medium voltage application, which also means that the grid codes you have to fulfill are not the one for the low voltage, but for the medium voltage grids. And they're less restrictive than the medium voltage grids. So it's easier to fulfill medium voltage grid codes than it is to fulfill low voltage grid codes. For example, those transformers and the primary sites fact system, they will eliminate a lot of noise distortions and other noisances that you would not like to have in the low voltage grid. But you're not connected to the low voltage grid. And that's a real beauty on this. The firing angle for the tie resistors can be controlled and the transformer can be built in a way that the voltages are matched in a very nice way, which means you're not trying to regulate the voltage down to zero. That would mean you have reactive power that wouldn't be nice to have. But tuning this application, you could get away with a cosine phi anywhere between 0.9 and 0.95 by designing the transformer properly. But as said, you would need the transformer anyway. And in that case, fulfilling the grid codes is something that is easily feasible. And that's why the tie restor in this application needs to be reviewed, particularly if facts are in place, which is very typical and common in medium voltage grids. There is no issue with operating the tie restors. Additionally, if desired, there could be a power factor correction stage added with a single switch. However, that's an option. 
inherently, the topology doesn't really need it. So, Martin, I think there is some confusion around efficiency. So can you address that a bit? Yes, I'd love to, because efficiency is something that is very often overdone. Imagine something is 60% efficient and somebody tells you, well, we can make it twice as efficient. That would mean it's 120% efficient. And physically, that's nonsense. So making something more efficient means you reduce the losses. So what happens if we change a system 97% efficient by just replacing it with something 99% efficient? This means you reduce the losses by 90%. So instead of 3% losses, you end up 0.3% of the losses. This also means you have far less effort in cooling the whole thing. Any heat you do not produce does not to be removed. And that's saving additional money on the thermal management side. Now, let's assume that in a few years from now, those chargers are omnipresent and they are operated around the clock. You want 400 kilowatt hours to be recharged during a small period of time, means you can serve 72 vehicles a day on a single charger. However, the single charger would transfer 288,000 kilowatt hours every day. That's the energy demand of a few streets in a major town. And then you check what happens to the losses. If you lose 3%, you would lose 38 million euro every year if you're an operator of a thousand chargers. A thousand chargers in commercial vehicles is not a big thing. There's currently projects going on to put up 1,700 chargers throughout Europe by a single consortium. So it can be expected that there will be several thousands of chargers of that kind in Germany alone. And operating those per thousand, losing 38 million euro every year, 38 million euro is something you should think about. So efficiency really is on top of the list. And for economics, things is one thing, but ecological things is another. A kilowatt hour today is burdened with something like half a kilogram of CO2. So the tire restore approach would save 140 million kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions for each thousand chargers installed every year. Wow. That's a big number. <laughs> that is a big number, Martin. So what would an overall comparison between current methodology and a thyristor-based approach look like? More of the same? We shouldn't. So this would be the approach as it is today. You stack a lot of boxes that handle a smaller power and you add a cooling system. The gray boxes denote 60 kilowatt units. So if you want to serve two and a half megawatts, you would pile up 42 units, 97% efficient, to achieve those 2.5 megawatts. And with 97% efficiency, you have to fight 60 kilowatt of losses. So getting away 60 kilowatt of thermal energy, you need a chiller the chiller itself would consume 20 kilowatt. So you would simply add more losses to the system. And this system would consume about six cubic meters of space for the power electronic units only. And 42 units would also mean you have 84 connections for the DC side and 126 units of screws on the input side. So putting it up, commissioning it, maintaining it may be difficult. So... Comparing this to a tire restore approach is this. That's the full stack with the B12 bridge. And it contains the 12 tire restores and forced air cooling only. So you don't even need liquid cooling and all the tubes and pumps and radiators that come with it. You just need six fans. Space-wise, it fits into slightly more than half a cubic meter, 0.6 actually. And if you put those systems side to side and compare... It means you get from a few thousand MOSFETs down to 12 thyristors. This is a massive reduction in complexity while having higher efficiency and superior lifetime. As said, we got electrolysis systems out there based on thyristors that are in operation for the last 40 years. And the defect quote for thyristors is literally zero. So availability, reliability, lifetime, Tire resistors in megawatt applications are unprecedented. 
you need lower space not only to build it, but you also need lower space in transporting the whole system. So instead of six cubic meters of space, you only need 0.6. The truck that brings a single of those classic approaches can bring five or six of the tie restrictor boxes. Well, transportation matters. Commissioning matters. This has three connectors for input and DC output. As simple as that. Lower cost of the tie restrictor approach and higher efficiency and lower losses and less energy paid for cooling also means the return of invest is much faster. And that's also something that matters for infrastructure systems. It all turns to total cost of ownership. If you want to set up a thousand systems and you can save the money between those two systems a thousand times and the energy lost in the differences a thousand times and that for the next 25 years, that's a lot of money returned. So total cost of ownership is getting lower as well. And finally, don't listen to what they tell you. Size matters. And in this case, it's about resources per kilowatt installed. So whether you need hundreds of screws, large transporters, encapsulations, casings, it all adds up not only to cost, but also to resources you need to build up the system. And in that manner, less is more, believe it. Excellent. Well, this has been super cool. But before we go, Martin, can you recap your main points for me? Gladly. Here we go. So as a summary, more of the same is something you can do because you say, I got my building blocks. It's tested. It's reliably appreciated. We do more of the same. But it may not be the best way to go. In commercial vehicle, it's very important to take a look at availability. Efficiency matters, particularly if you have those huge amounts of energy. We're talking about gigawatt hours to be transferred in the years ahead, and losing a fraction of gigawatt still is megawatt hours. So efficiency matters, availability is important, reliability is important, and companies that build up infrastructure plan for 25 to 35 years of operation. The transformers mentioned, particularly in Germany, we got transformers in operation that were built right after World War II in the early 50s, which means they turn 80 years in service by now and they still work as on day one. The one component that features this unprecedented lifetime is the tire restore, and that's why it should be reviewed. However, in the megawatt application, there's good reasons why we don't see tire restores in DC chargers with lower power. But once you turn into the megawatt regime, the tire restore deserves a second look. And I predict it receives another challenging application to be served with it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Martin. I very much enjoyed our discussion today. Appreciate. Thanks for the invitation and for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Little Fuse. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section at EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>